Remember Joseph, he was more loved by his father than any of his 11 brothers. And his father gave him a coat. And at that time, Joseph was 17 years old. And it was not just any coat. It was a coat with many colors, as we believe. Um, there is some debate about the uh, translation, whether it really means many colors uh, or that it was a royal coat, it was in any case a special coat um, having colors. Now, in those days, people didn't wear much colors because um, they were expensive to, to produce. Most, uh, most of the garments were white, gray, uh, brownish, uh, depending on the color of the wool of the sheep or the, the camels from which the, the, the wool was taken. And um, if you wanted to color, to put colors, then uh, that had to specifically be produced with different uh, substances. And it was costly. So if you were wearing, wearing colors, and especially if you were wearing many colors, you would be noted for sure. And so Joseph had this multicolored coat. And I will put it up here. Now, every time Joseph's brothers would see him wearing his coat, and he was wearing it, then they envied him. They were jealous, it says in Genesis 37, verse 11. The coat was so special that um, when Joseph was sent to his brothers who were in the field with the sheep, they could see him from afar, it says in Genesis 37, verse 18. From far away they could see him because of the coat, it, stick, it stuck out. Actually, from the time that they saw him until he was with them, they had enough time to plot to murder him and to throw him into a pit, which was an empty well. They even had time to, uh, to argue with Reuben, who was the oldest uh, son, um, whether or not they should kill him. Reuben said they should not kill him and just leave him in the pit. And Reuben was thinking by himself, then I will go back later to get him out. He didn't want to uh, create this uh, immense sorrow for his uh, father. Um, so they had time to, to plot and debate about this from the moment they saw him until he was with them. Uh, that um, From that far away they could see him. And what is the first thing they do when he gets to them? The very first thing, they take his coat. They take his coat. So eventually the plan changes and they sell Joseph to some Ishmaelite uh, merchantmen from Midian, it says. Which is very interesting. We looked at this a while ago uh, when we talked about Zipporah. That Joseph, of course, is the son of or a descendant, uh, not a son, but a descendant of Abram and Sarah, whereas the Ishmaelites were descendants of uh, Abram and Hagar. And um, they came from Midian, and the Midianites were descendants of Abram and Keturah. So, in a sense, they were all uh, from, the same, uh, from the same father, from the same ancestor. But that's just a detail. The brothers, um, Joseph's brothers, they, they, they drip the blood of a lamb on the coat and uh, they bring it back to their father, Jacob. And they say, look what we found. Could it be Joseph's coat? Now, that was, of course, a silly question. If it was not so tragic, because whose coat would it else be? Who was walking around with such a special coat? Of course, it was Joseph's coat. Well, the rest is history. We talked in part about that last week. Now, what had gotten Joseph into trouble? This is a question. He was the youngest at that time. Um, there was Benjamin um, after him, but um, he was uh, 
too young to be with his brethren in the field, um, and so uh, he stayed at his father's house. So he could not, um, he was not around his bro- his brethren uh, to argue with them or to annoy them uh, or anything. Um, why uh, why did all this get him into this, this trouble? Was it because he had the multicolored coat and they didn't? No. The problem was not that he had a coat. The problem was that he was wearing it. He was wearing it. He was proud of it. He was showing his brethren all the time that he was different. Most probably if he had left his coat at home and had worn the same kind of uh, garment that they had, things might have turned out differently. But this coat was an expression of the love of his father. Now your heavenly father loves you too. And he gave you also a multicolored coat, a special coat. And the question is, are you wearing it? Are you wearing it? And that is the theme of today. And it connects with what we spoke about in past weeks, uh, about putting on a new man. Because maybe you remember uh, that uh, I mentioned this Greek word that Paul uses when he speaks about putting on the new man. And vio, put, to put on, it's a regular Greek word that, that we use every day when we refer to putting on, putting on clothes. So uh, putting on a multicolored coat, you would use the same word in Greek and you. So the question is, are you wearing it? Are you putting on this new man? If you do, yes, of course, people will see you from afar. They will talk about you. They will plot against you. They will get you into trouble. That's actually a promise. Jesus said, in this world you will find trouble. Not you may, you might, you will find trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome this world. And he said also, they will hate you. But they hated me first. So yes, you will get into trouble wearing this multicolored coat. The question is, are you willing to face it and wear your coat nonetheless with pride? Or do you rather play it safe and keep your coat in the closet and wear what everybody else is wearing and stay out of trouble? Remember when you first received your colored coat of faith? Something special and precious that made you stick out. You are now called a Christian. Maybe you got baptized, maybe you gave your testimony. Everything felt different. But how long did it last? How long before you realized that you still like the things that you liked before? That you still have the same friends and like to be around them? That you still like to listen to the same music? That you still do the same sports? Have the same passions? You may wear your coat, but not all the time. You can be a part-time Christian. That works well for you, but it doesn't work well for God. And this is why God reminds us so often who we are, who we were before and who we are now. And so the question may be, okay, what were we before? Therefore, I go to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. It says there, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what were we before? Dead. That's what it says. Dead. Not wearing the multicolored coat of salvation, but the black coat of death. That's where we were before. Why were we like that before? That is answered in the next two verses, Ephesians 2, verse 2 and 3, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. 
we were dead because that's the way of the world. That's the way of the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. That is the way of when, where we are when we follow our own desires. It leads to death only. And it says this is the nature of the children of wrath. And we, are, we, were, we were walking in that nature. But it doesn't end there. This is what we were. Then Paul continues with very beautiful and pivotal words, but God, in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are, were, are saved. He gave us, in his great love, a new God. And that is salvation in Christ. No more death, but life. Resurrected with Jesus. So, what is our problem? Why are we often part-time Christians? Why do we behave like a dog that returns to its own vomit? Why be a beggar while we were made princes and princesses? Well, one reason is our bad memory. We need to be reminded all the time. And that is why Paul wrote his epistles, like this one to the Ephesians. And that is why we are listening to God's word right now. But then you may say, well, that was to the Ephesians. That's not for me. Well, let's see who these Ephesians were and whether we are in a similar situation. Ephesus was uh, the capital of the Roman province of Asia, and that is today in Turkey. And Paul visited the city twice, and he stayed uh, the second time he stayed there uh, more than two years, as we uh, have read in Acts 19 when we went through that. The city housed the temple of Diana, or Artemis, of Ephesus. It was one of the seven wonders of the world in those days. In it was actually only recently rediscovered in 1869, and then in 1965 more was unearthed. And inside that temple was a black meteorite. Uh, they called it the image that fell down from Jupiter, in Acts 19, verse 35. And that meteorite roughly looked like a woman. Diana, Diana, the goddess of fertility, a sex goddess. But the temple was also a treasury and a bank. So merchants, kings and cities, they made their deposits there. And um, they believed that it was kept safe under the protection of the goddess. Ephesus was a very important place in the area, both religiously and economically. Like um, Antioch and Corinth, similar. And so there was a lot of commerce and a lot of immorality. They often go together. There was occultism, there was sorcery, and there was a large theater for, where performances and parties were held. It's actually the only theater mentioned uh, in the Bible, in Acts 19 verse 31, and it's still um, largely preserved today. So if you look at the whole situation there, then it sounds a lot like today, like cities and life today. And in the midst of this were the Christians. They were sticking out. They were not part of it. They were wearing a multicolored coat. The Christians, called the way, in Ephesus, were under a lot of pressure. Uh, they were under influence and temptations, economically, spiritually, morally, because of all the things that were going, around, uh, going on around them. And it sounds a lot like Christians today, doesn't it? Were they able to wear, uh, to keep wearing their coats in this environment? To not become part-time Christians? To not go back to their old passions? Well, let's see what Jesus writes to them about 30 years later, because they got another letter now um, from Jesus. 
And we find it, of course, in Revelation chapter 2. And I read verse 1, where it says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So here we see to whom the letter is addressed and who is writing it. And um, from the preceding verses uh, in, in Revelation chapter 1, we know that this is Jesus. And we also get an explanation about what these candlesticks uh, and stars are. But we talked about that in another message. Then he continues, uh, skip to verse 4. Um, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Something has changed. And uh, it is in part a bad memory. Bad memory that caused this. They had forgotten their first love. There's actually more to that, but I will get to that uh, another time, Lord willing. But what is the first love? What is he talking about? The first love is when they received their multicolored coat. When they were so excited and when they were first called followers of Christ. Christians, that's us. The Father in his great love gave us a gift and we have forgotten it. We put it away and we, we don't even think about it. Like the Israelites who were baptized in the sea. At the Exodus, as we read in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, within 48 hours they had forgotten about that miraculous great event and all the plagues that happened before that uh, in Egypt that led up to the Exodus. And they were murmuring, that is us. That is us. So what now? Well, Jesus tells what to do in Revelation 2, verse 5. He says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. So there are three verbs in this verse, and I say it often, look at the verbs, they tell you what you need to do. First one is remember. I said before, it's it's bad memory. That's you, you, how you could summarize uh, the cause. Bad memory. So you have to remember. Not just now, but daily. Be in the Word. Pray. Remember what God has done for you. Remember what you promised Him. Because we are under a covenant. Remember. And then... Repent, because now that you remember what was before and where you are now, now you are ready to repent, to turn around and to go the other direction, the right direction. Uh, repentance in Hebrew, teshuva, comes from the word, from the root shuv, which means literally turn around. The opposite direction. In other words, get your coat out of the closet, wipe off the dust and wear it all the time. Do the first works is the third thing that he says. Do or act the way you act in the beginning. Find that same enthusiasm and happiness and do it again and keep doing it. So uh, in short three verbs remember, repent and redo. R R R. It's easy to remember. Remember, remember, repent and redo. There's also a warning he gives because he says, or else. That sounds threatening and in a way it is. It's not just uh, playing around, it is serious here. Or else, or else what? I remove your candlestick. You may say, so what? But what does it mean? It means you're no longer a church. You're no longer part of the church. You're no longer part of the bride. That's a very dire consequence. So, um, we should take this very serious. So I say once again, remember Joseph. He may have lost his coat, because it was the first thing that the, his brothers took from him, his coat. 
but he kept his faith. The coat was the outward expression of what he had received, but he had received it in his heart, and that stayed. He was only 17 years old. He was taken to a strange land with a different language, with uh, different gods and religions, and uh, everything was different than before. He lost his family, he lost everything. But he kept his faith. And God blessed him for it. And then, from the pit, he went to the house of Potiphar, where he um, had a good position at some point. He was basically in charge of everything there. The main servant. And again, he was tempted. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. Not just once, but day after day after day, relentlessly. And he was a young man. He could easily have given in to it. Um, but he didn't. Because he said, this goes against God. He was God-fearing. And what happens? She grabs him by the coat and he runs away. And she holds only the coat. Again, he loses his coat. But again, he keep, keeps his faith. He ends up in prison. And he gets out of prison also. We talked about that last week. What's the first thing we read that the Pharaoh does when he takes Joseph out of prison? He gives him a new coat. The coat is just an expression. It's an outward symbol. But it, it's what reflects that what's inside. And that should be the case. It should be so in our case. Code is what you see. People must be able to see who we are, where we stand. What Joseph experienced are the same daily seductions, temptations and threats that we are under. And they try to take our code. And uh, they may even succeed in removing outward things. But they should never be able to succeed in removing what's in our heart. We should not allow that to happen. Joseph never lost his faith. He was not a part-time Christian, if you can call him a Christian, but he was a full-time man of God. What an example. And so here we are in the last days, not the days of the church of Ephesus, but the days of the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And Jesus reminds us again, that if we feel comfortable in this lukewarm church, being part-time Christians, then we have lost our coat. To the church of Laodicea, he writes in Revelation 3, verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And naked. No coat. But he says, you don't even realize it. And he gives a warning in verse uh, Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. And then he gives also an advice what to do. Revelation 3, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thy, thou mayest see. Get clothes, and here he speaks about a white garment, which is the color of righteousness, as we can read in Revelation 19. The point is, we must wear our coat, the coat of salvation, um, the coat that testifies of our faith and our uh, allegiance to God. Uh, no matter what threats and temptations we are under, we must not allow our coat to be taken from us. Stand strong in the faith. Ask this question yourself. Am I wearing it? Where is my coat? Am I wearing it? Do people see it? How do they respond? These are questions that, um, with which you can test, sort of, where you stand as a believer. And Joseph is a wonderful example to look at. Amen. Amen.